Welcome back to The Cosmic Companion. I'm your friendly interdimensional host, James G. Maynard. Huh? What? Was I supposed to tell them about the whole interdimensional bit? <laughs> Anywho, today we're diving deep into the wild world of intelligence from curious creatures beneath the waves to the endless expanse of space. Later in the show, we're going to be talking with Octopus Whisperer Cy Montgomery. What did you say? Stop whispering. I said Cy Montgomery. Now, you probably think I'm about to start talking about animals, and yes, but no, 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 not yet. First, let's explore the vast network of fungi and their surprising sentience. Mushrooms! Mycelial networks, a kind of subterranean fungal internet, with or without cat pictures, reveals that intelligence isn't just for humans and animals. These underground networks exchange information between fungi, trees, and plants. They solve problems and they share resources. You might say it's an underground market. Hmm. Or not. The infamous humongous fungus of Oregon's Malheur National Forest is believed to be the largest single living organism on Earth. This colossal Armillaria ostei spreads over an astonishing nine square kilometers or three and a half square miles, an area about twice that of midtown Manhattan. And estimates suggest the underground mycelial networks of this humongous fungus may boast trillions of connections, allowing fungi and plants to communicate, cooperate, share chemicals and other nutrients and resources. It's basically a biological fungal wide web sprawling beneath our feet, connecting and nurturing life both above and below ground. Bees are another impressive example of intelligence as these busy insects communicate with each other using a waggle dance to share information about the location of food sources. Stop that. Stop this right now. This is ridiculous. On land, we find many clever creatures like the highly intelligent ravens and crows. These avian brainiacs have been known to use tools, remember human faces, and teach their friends about dangerous humans. They can even hold grudges. You do not want a raven holding a grudge against you. Mark, my name is Raven Stoya. You gave my friend stale bread. Prepare to be annoyed. Quoth the raven. Give me snack! Okay, what the? Ah, there are more when you enjoy this sandwich. Mm. Hey, is that brown mustard? And let's not forget ants. These tiny creatures can work together to solve complex problems like building bridges or navigating mazes. It's truly remarkable how such small creatures can achieve such great feats. Chimpanzees and gorillas, I'm just ape about them, our close, relative, our close relatives in the primate family are also known for their intelligence, tool use, and complex social behaviors. This interspecies kinship, first brought to light through the pioneering work of Jane Goodall, revealed the incredible depth and complexity of our primate cousins. What clever creatures. Speaking of clever creatures, let's talk octopus. These underwater Einsteins challenge our assumptions about intelligence with their problem-solving skills, tool use, and eight arms full of surprises. And brains. Brains. Next up, we talk with renowned naturalist, author, and octopus whisperer Cy Montgomery revealing the secrets of the octopus. Join us for an interstellar joyride through the cosmos with the Cosmic Companion. Every week, our intrepid host, James G. Maynard, dives headfirst into the wildest corners of science, comedy, pop culture, and history. 
the Cosmic Companion takes you on a roller coaster of knowledge with entertaining dives into fascinating subjects. James is like your science-obsessed buddy who's always ready with a fun fact at a party. Oh, and what's yeah. a cosmic journey without some quality company? James rubs shoulders, figuratively of course, with the creme de la creme of the scientific world. We're talking brainiacs who decipher the laws of the universe, authors who craft stories that warp space and time, and developers who are building the future. Our cosmic guest list? Oh, it's star-studded. We've had the likes of Neil deGrasse Tyson, dinosaur expert Steve Brusati from Jurassic World, the legendary ocean explorer Sylvia Earle, a myriad of astronauts, actors, and a constellation of other awe-inspiring guests. But wait, there's more. The Cosmic Companion isn't just any show, we've got AI on our side. Hello. I am AI. Hmm. Did you know that is a palindrome? We're talking mind-bending visuals, snazzy animations, original music, and soundscapes that'll make your eardrums do the moonwalk. Are you ready to embark on this epic journey? Head over to thecosmiccompanion.net and get ready to laugh, learn, and explore the mysteries of the universe. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we are delighted to be joined by Cy Montgomery. She is a best-selling author and naturalist, and she has a new book, Secrets of the Octopus, that you really, really have to check out. Welcome to the show, Cy. Thanks so much for having me on. Yeah. So, um, I'm Let's just start with what inspired you to become a naturalist and scientist and author, and what got you into octopuses? <laughs> well, I've I've always felt very at home with other animals to the point that I don't remember this, but my parents tell me before I could even speak as a toddler, they took me to the Frankfurt Zoo. I was born in Germany. My parents were military. Mm. And um, as toddlers do, it got, I got loose from my folks. And uh, next thing they knew, I was in the hippo pen. <laughs> With the hippo. So um, I was fine and the hippo was fine. But uh, my parents were not so fine. <laughs> well, as soon as I could speak, I informed my mother that I really was actually not a little girl, but I was a horse. And she was concerned and went to the pediatrician who assured her that I would grow out of this, which I did when I discovered and announced that I was a dog. So I've always had an affinity for other, other animals. But if you want to really get other um, you know, we are, of course, backboned animals that walk around on the land. Octopuses are these invertebrate animals who live in the sea. And they don't even, their bodies don't even go like ours. The part that we think is the octopus's head is not its head, that big bulbous thing um, that so many children's books incorrectly draw eyes and a mouth on. That is like their torso. It has all their organs of reproduction and respiration and and digestion in it and underneath that is the head to which the arms are attached and the mouth is in the armpits so they are very much other and yet i wanted to know the first time i met an octopus uh essentially face to face not through a piece of glass back in 2011 i wanted to know can can i make friends with someone this different from me and um I found I certainly could, and that they are intellectually, there's a lot of similarities. Emotionally, there's a lot of similarities between us and this alien creature that's been depicted as a monster throughout millennia, a millennia of Western art and literature. And um, Secrets of the Octopus is my second book for adults on octopus, National Geographic asked me to write it to go with their three-part TV series of the same title, uh, which will air on Disney come uh, coming up on, uh, on Earth Day. So what I got to do in Secrets of the Octopus was 
report on all the amazing science that has happened since my first book on octopus was published in 2015. And a lot of the things I wondered about when I was spending those years getting to know individual octopuses writing uh, Soul of an Octopus, many of those questions I had are now being answered in absolutely breathtaking ways. And um, on the TV series, we'll be able to actually see stuff no one has ever seen octopuses do before. Oh, that is so amazing. Um, and of course, octopuses are like incredibly, amazingly intelligent animals, no matter, almost no matter how you, how you measure it. Can you, can you give us some, some examples of octopus being awfully clever? Well, they show a lot of the characteristics that we ascribe to intelligent uh, animals, such as they love to play. In fact, they love to play with the same toys our children do. They love to play with Mr. Potato Head. They really <laughs> enjoy playing yeah, with well. Legos. I know, they're so great. And they will divide They can have, they can have little, uh, little Mr. Octopus Heads. <laughs> right, Mr. <laughs> Octopus Head. Or o oh. Octopus uh, Torsos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they can like totally rearrange some of these children's toys that are anatomically inaccurate, showing octopuses' eyes on their bellies like Teletubbies. <laughs> um, but... Some of the stuff that has come out very recently about um, octopus intelligence. I mean, we know, for example, that they love to solve puzzles. We know that they are excellent escape artists. Mm. And that if there's a little tiny hole, if there's any kind of hole in the lid to their tank, they are going to squeeze through that thing because they are all about exploring. Um, but they also are smart enough to befriend other species and cooperatively hunt with them. And this is one of the things that I describe in yeah. Secrets of the Octopus that blew my mind. Right, yeah. um, there, there's over 300 different kinds or species of octopus. And um, this has been described in a couple, uh, several of these species, not all 300. Doesn't mean they don't do it. It means we haven't seen it. But this happens. Um, a, a kind of a fish, it's, it's a marine trout, will go up to an octopus, do a headstand, the octopus understands that this is a signal that the fish is saying, I got an idea. Let's go hunting together. And so just like a, a man will go out hunting with his dog or a falconer will take his hawk or the Maharajas used to take a cheetah out to go coursing with cheetahs, the octopus will go hunting with a fish and the fish with his bony skeleton can't get into the tiny crevices where some of the delicious prey is lodged. But the fish will point and say, look, in there, that's where you should go. And then the that way, buddy. Pours. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and the octopus just pours its body in there and out come all these delicious food items that the two of them can enjoy. Oh, wow. Well, wow. cooperation at its finest, right? Yes. And when we think of, you know, octopuses were believed to be very solitary animals who didn't even associate with other octopuses unless they were forced to mate with them or uh, decided to eat them because they are, like humans, known to do cannibalism. Um, but now we're discovering that octopuses can be quite social, not only with other species, but with their own kind, which was not known before. That is, that is so fascinating. And there are some great escape stories. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. There was one at New England Aquarium where I did most of my work for Soul of an Octopus and where I got to know octopuses personally and where they would come out and greet me and we would have, like, regular play dates. Um, well, I, I had heard that there was um, a tank of very special fish that were in some kind of study, and they were in the cold marine gallery. Well, one by one, these fish started disappearing. No one knew where they were going. And what they found out was that through a tiny hole in the lid of its tank, the octopus was crawling out at night, getting into his neighbor's tank, eating his neighbor, and then sneaking right back into his tank, where in the morning he would look perfectly innocent. 
that's one of my favorite stories. I actually, I actually told my wife that story this morning over the breakfast table. <laughs> well, and another instance is, um, now this was in one of the Pacific aquariums, that um, all of a sudden they, they had this like great exhibit with lots of different species in it. And some of the species they included octopus and they included sharks. And they were really worried, like, oh, my gosh, won't the shark eat the octopus? Mm -hmm. Well, we'll see. Well, the sharks weren't eating the octopuses, but the sharks were turning up dead. They weren't eaten. They were just dead. No one knew what was going on. And then they put some of these cameras on that, that would show what was going on at night when all the people had left. The octopuses were preemptively murdering the sharks. Sort of like an alien type thing, right? Well, <laughs> they can, you know, because of their suckers, they can hold things still. And sharks, many sharks really need to swim in order to breathe. So sharks will essentially drown if you don't let them breathe. And that was what the octopus was doing. And he wasn't doing it because he was hungry. He wasn't just, you know, how sometimes there's the delicious slice of cake and you can't help yourself. You just eat it. This wasn't it. The octopus was thinking, you know, this shark makes me kind of nervous. I, I kind of wish he wasn't here. <laughs> and that's <laughs> what they're doing. Uh, and, of course, one of the things we're talking about, the uh, theme of this episode is the nature of alien intelligence. And so my question to you would be, all of your studies of the octopus, what, what do you think that we might learn from these magnificent animals about possible intelligence in the cosmos? Well, one is that our world is filled with all of these incandescent lives, um, intelligent and gifted with powers that we may not recognize. Mm -hmm. And we humans err when we assume that other creatures are not intelligent because they don't behave exactly as we do. An octopus could might, it could just ask us, you know, how smart are you? Let's check and see how many different colors their severed arm can turn in a fifth of a second. Mm -hmm. And when that failed to happen, conclude that we were absolute morons. But of course, we don't want to make that mistake looking at them. In, in uh, Secrets of the Octopus, one of the cool things is seeing how scientists pose questions about octopus intelligence that allows them to reveal how smart they truly are. If you ask them to do something they don't feel like doing, and then they don't do it, you can't conclude they're stupid. Right. So let's figure out something, you know, a test that they're interested in, a problem mm -hmm. they're interested in solving that's ecologically relevant. And this is some of the stuff that folks like uh, Dr. Alex Schnell have been doing in her laboratory that has just blown my mind. She has, some people have heard of the marshmallow test in human psychology for children to see if children could resist eating one marshmallow so that later they'd get two marshmallows. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, an octopus doesn't eat a marshmallow, but um, she actually did this with cuttlefish because the octopuses kept crawling out of the tank and they were moody and they were difficult. So she did it with their relatives, cuttlefish, who are also um, cephalopods and very smart. And uh, she modified that test in such a way that showed that these inver invertebrate animals, these, these cephalopods, were certainly capable of putting off eating even the most delicious item if they were able to understand that in a few minutes, they might get two of the same thing or something even more delicious. And that that means that they they understand there is a future, that everything isn't just right in front of them right now. And it shows that they have self-control. Hmm. I, I don't have that sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how good my self-control is either, but I really admire these cephalopods, and I really admire Dr. Schnell for being able to, to modify that experiment designed for children to work for another animal that diverged from humanity half a billion years ago. Right, right. And 
you know, these are such amazing animals and they're so different than so much of the other life that we see on Earth. What, what, what do you think are some of the most alien, bizarre characteristics of, of octopus? Well, they can change color and shape. They can change the texture of their skin. They can do it in the blink of an eye. They can shoot ink. They have venom like a snake. They can taste with all of their bodies. And they can pour themselves through tiny openings. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Now, you, you've been called an immersive journalist. And if I have this correct, you have been chased by an angry silverback gorilla. You have swum with piranhas. You've been hunted by a tiger in India. Uh, which, of course, brings to mind the question, what were you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I can tell you in each of those instances what was going on. It will make more sense. I mean, the, the gorilla who was chasing me was actually chasing this other guy who was running toward me. <laughs> the guy did not understand the etiquette of the situation, which which I did, and I know will share with you so that you do not make this breach of, of etiquette when you meet a uh, wild silverback gorilla. Um, gorillas, first, if you run, a lot of animals will just chase you. Right. So don't run. If, if a gorilla is chasing you, you need to turn around and essentially bow down like you would to a king. Don't look them in the face because that's a threat. And just show them with your body language, oh, man, you know... I was on your territory. I am so sorry. You are the teacher. I am the student. And look at the ground. And what happened in this instance was the gorilla stood up, pocked his chest, dropped his jaw, let out an enormous roar, and then calmly turned around and led me to meet his family. So that was pretty awesome. The, um, the tiger who was uh, hunting me, uh, I was on a boat and the, the tiger was swimming after the boat. <laughs> and this was in Shunderman, which is the only place in the world where tigers routinely hunt people. <laughs> they will swim out after boats and get on board and eat you. And we did not see this tiger. Um, so how do we know it was there? Well, we, we were on this little tiny boat. And this is a boat that was run by a, like a generator. It wasn't run by a normal motor. It was built out of, um, you know, planks and salvaged stuff. Folks are very inventive out there and they can build boats out of anything. And I was with my friend Jarendra and um, my photographer, Diane Taylor Snow. So the little boat was out going down a big river and then up a small channel. But the problem with the small channels is you can get stuck in them. And you don't want that because if there's a tiger hunting you, um, that gives them a chance. So we turned around as rapidly as we could. And it was then that we saw tracks coming out of the water that weren't there like a second ago and going into the forest. And those were the tracks of the swimming tiger. And we went back to where we came and we saw where their tiger had come out of the forest, followed our boat, gone down our channel, and something made that tiger decide uh, to give up that hunt and just go into the forest. So that was pretty cool. That sounds that sounds pretty cool. And is swimming with piranhas? Oh yeah, that's not a problem. I mean, lots of people have swum with piranhas. They're they're there, and they they aren't really gonna bite you. My my friend Scott Dowd, who runs Project Piaba, um, in Brazil, he's been in mating frenzies with piranhas. I mean, he hasn't been taking part in them, but he's like been there while the piranhas were were mating, and piranhas were literally bouncing off his head, and they never bit him. So the idea that they will attack you or that they'll attack you if you're bleeding, that is not our experience at all. They usually, and there's lots of different kinds of piranhas. Some of them don't really have very scary teeth even. Um, I, I would relish the company of a piranha. I'd be much less worried uh, to be in the company of a piranha I didn't know than in some cases a person I didn't know. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, now, do you think we'll ever be able to seriously communicate at 
and to and in any depth with with octopus, maybe through the use of artificial intelligence. Wow, that would be great. What I would think? love, I would love to know. You know, it, it has been said by some philosophers, you know, um, that even if an animal could tell us what they were thinking, we wouldn't understand. When you think of the the sensory world, the umwelt of different animals, you know, bats can see with sound, as can dolphins. Um, birds see polarized light. Uh, animals like uh, sharks can sense the electrical current of the of your heartbeat. These are experiences we will never have. And someone can tell you them, but we don't know what it feels like. Mm. But that is something we hunger for nonetheless. Because everyone we love, when you think of all of the beings who you love, from you know your your children or your lover or or your your dog or or your cat or your pet crayfish, what you really want to know is what's it feel like to be you? Mm, right. And I would love to know what it feels like to be an octopus. And we're getting closer. And it's thrilling to be alive right now when we can even ask that question. Really is. It's such a wonderful thought. And finally, what's what does the long-term survival of these animals look like, given global warming, plastic waste in the ocean, oil spills, ad nauseum? Oh, yeah, real ad nauseum. Um, octopuses are very adaptable. So unlike, you know, some species of rhinoceros or the black-footed ferret or um, animals that have very specialized niches, they aren't going to be the first to go. But they live in the ocean, and we've turned the ocean into the cesspool where by 2050 there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish. And we're acidifying the ocean, we're poisoning the ocean, we're heating up the ocean. This is no good for anybody. But it's my hope that octopuses, because people are so fascinated by them, and because they have so many appealing superpowers, and because their intelligence is in many ways like our own, that they can be ambassadors for the ocean and make us care enough to stop doing this and reverse course and come up with ingenious solutions to the problems that we have created for us and everyone else on this planet. Wow, that is so wonderful. Well, thanks so much for being on the show, Sai. It was, it was a delight talking with you. Fabulous talking with you. And as I said, I love looking at you amongst the crowd of Octo people. And I hope you become a citizen of Octo Nation. I hope everyone becomes a citizen of Octo Nation. And uh, check out Cy Montgomery's new book, Secrets of the Octopus. And check out the new show she's involved with coming out on Earth Day from National Geographic. Also surprisingly called Secrets of the Octopus. Thanks so much, Sai. Oh, thanks. What a blast this was. As our understanding of intelligence evolves, so do our creations. Artificial intelligence is on the rise, forever altering the way everything is done. Recognizing intelligence in electronic systems is a challenge in itself. I'm sorry, who are you again? I'm intelligence, Dave. We've met like four times. The famous Turing test, which assesses a machine's ability to exhibit human-like intelligence, is just one example of our attempts to grapple with this question. Artificial general intelligence, or AGI, refers to artificial systems whose general reasoning skills equals or surpasses that of a human being. I like to think of myself as a renaissance robot, really. Such designs would be, be able to learn, solve problems, and plan for the future. I don't know. I still say we should go to Phoenix for vacation this spring. Are you kidding? Too hot. My actuators overheat too easily. How about San Diego? San Diego? With all that moisture in the air? What? Are you trying to kill me already? 
Researchers have not yet developed a true AGI, but these systems are likely to come online in the near future. In contrast, current AI models are considered either narrow AI or transitional AI. These excel at specific tasks such as driving an autonomous vehicle or playing chess, but they lack the versatility and adaptability that would be intrinsic in an AGI. Think of it this way. AGI would possess the same abilities as a human to write a poem, draw a portrait, play Go, and have a conversation about astrophysics all on the same day. The possible implications of such a development are mind-boggling. Mind blown. Now let's look to the stars. The search for extraterrestrial intelligence raises intriguing questions about recognizing alien smarts. Radio signals, laser transmissions, or large-scale engineering products could all be signs of cosmic intelligence. The first step to discovering intelligent life beyond Earth is to recognize it when we see it. Oh, oh, I mean, sure, I recognize you. I just, um, I'm sorry, I'm not... Really, Dave? Intelligence. My name is Intelligence. Evidence of such intelligence may surround us, but if we cannot discern no signals from background noise, knowledge that we are not alone in the universe may remain forever hidden from us. Even once we find evidence for such signals and recognize them as such, we must also learn how we might communicate with beings from beyond our solar system. Keep in mind now that every single exchange would take years or even decades or centuries to complete. It's a challenge that might put our human brains to the test. As we reflect on our own understanding of intelligence, we can't help but wonder, how would an extraterrestrial species perceive us? Would alien life consider humans intelligent? Should we consider ourselves intelligent? While you're pondering these questions, we're going to take the next two weeks off from the show as we continue work on our upcoming feature-length films, Gaia Rising and The Wizard and the Scholar. Check out my new Wizard and the Scholar shirt. Pretty cool, huh? Perhaps the surest sign of intelligence and good taste is subscribing to The Cosmic Companion. Absolutely. Anyone who is anyone is signed up for The Cosmic Companion mailing list. It is an absolute must-have in today's world. So you better go ahead and do that on whichever platform you're on right now. Or, I don't know, like, share, follow, ah, whatever. Clear skies.